10 petawatt lasers, but uh, we have a short pulse, it's uh, about 20 femtoseconds. So this, all these projects is uh, originally initiated by the Professor Gerard Moro. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018 with uh, his student Donald Strickland. And both of them invent uh, this uh, pulse amplification. And this uh, is a kind of technique to boost the intensity because uh, in the laser, if you learn about the laser physics, you have the cavity, you have the crystal, everything. But uh, at certain limit, the intensity cannot uh, increase because uh, you further increase this intensity, the crystal or something will, will be broken. So we have to invent some uh, alternative methods. So they come up with this uh, chip off amplification and is able to boost this uh, intensity many orders. And then the, this Eli have cost about a few millions, a few hundred million of euros. And for detail, you can find this uh, article or on the web. There are detail about these three projects. And then I have some of the, these introduction videos and I'm going to play it. And I don't know if you can hear it and let me know if you can hear it. This is kind of a promo video. Hey, Doctor, I think we can't hear it. Do you hear any sound? Uh, no. Okay, a moment. Yeah, it's okay. Let me... Uh, wait, I have to go out first and stop sharing. Just a moment. All right. Do you hear anything? Uh, no. I don't think we are hearing anything. But no, my we just look out. Okay, okay. All right, so let us go on. And now today is uh, specifically on this uh, Eli NP. And uh, this uh, Eli NP is located uh, around the capital of Romania is called the the capital of Romania is called Bucharest and uh, you can see there are some picture and so to the right uh, to this one is the experimental area 
where there is uh, two lasers behind. And I will show you the landscape of this uh, uh, experimental area. And we have the cafeteria and also the office building. And so this is the layout of the experimental area. So you see the red two arm of the red uh, line here is actually the lasers. Uh, consists of uh, crystal amplifiers, mirror and something. And this laser will be transported into the experimental area at the front here. So there are about eight uh, experimental areas. So it's named by E1 to E8. And each area study different things. We have uh, nuclear physics and QED high field and also positron medical or something. Um, except these two lasers, we have uh, another. If you see this uh, line blue here, this is a linear accelerator. So this accelerator can generate about uh, 600 MeV of electrons. And this electron will collide with the lasers to produce a very high intensity gamma rays. And uh, this is the control room of the lasers. And the lasers with, uh, was built by a company called Autalus. And the red one is, is you see the two arms. And when you open these red boxes, there's a optics inside, um, uh, amplify these uh, lasers and control room uh, compressor. And then we have uh, three types of uh, lasers. It's 100 terawatts, 1 petawatt, and 10 petawatt. And we have uh, two 10 petawatt laser. And it was just demonstrated last year. And we reached like 10.7 petawatts. And uh, I should give you a picture of, of how this, uh, how big is this uh, 10 petawatt later. So you see here is the experimental area already uh, installed, the beam line and the chambers. And the bottom here is uh, our experimental area in our group. And they are start to perform some experiment. And uh, this is a kind of the list of uh, experiment that uh, we have, and then uh, we are already starting to do some uh, electron acceleration experiment. That's with, that is the we accelerate the electrons within a few millimeters, and we obtain the energy of uh, like hundred mega electron volts. And I will show you later about how about these uh, electron acceleration things, and. And then the concept of this uh, imaging of this uh, 10 petal one. So the average of the solar irradiance on the Earth's surface is about 174 watt per meter square. So if you take the, if you multiply with the surface, half of the surface of the Earth, because uh, only half will receive the sunlight, and the 10.7 Beta watts is equivalent to 12% of this uh, solar irradiance. So if we use this 12% of uh, or 10 petawatt irradiance and we put an optic and we focus it onto a spot, the spot of uh, very small is two microns. If you see here, the intensity is uh, relation with this uh, uh, laser powers divided by the spot area, and this is a spot radius. So two micron radius, we are able, we expect we can get the intensity 10 to 23 watts per centimeter square. And this intensity is very high. And I think so far, nobody have uh, achieved this uh, level of intensity yet. And we expect uh, Many interesting physics will happen with uh, this in intensity, like uh, QED process or something like that. And then this is a kind of a, a laser, the left one is kind of the laser 
intensity development over the years. So initially, after uh, when the laser was developed, there's uh, like kill switch or mode lock uh, method to increase the laser intensity. But uh, this intensity is uh, saturated for quite some time until uh, this chip pulse amplification that I mentioned just now, um, they was invented by the Professor Gerard Muru. And since then, the laser intensity increased gradually until now. So at uh, each level of the intensity, the physics is different. So let's say if 10 to 16 or 10 to 15, the physics is just uh, at, at the atomic level. For example, you are ionizing the electron from the atoms, and that's it. If you increase further, then you will enter the relativistic uh, regime, which uh, I will talk about later. So, so far at the present day, the laser intensity that we uh, human or in the world achieve or the world record is uh, 10 to 22. But that is just intensity. There's no experimental, uh, there are no experimental yet on this uh, intensity. So if we further increase, we have the strong radiation reaction and increase one more orders, we have uh, pair production from these electrons and uh, these uh, gammas. And then if we further increase to the level of 10 to 29, we reach a call a swinger limit. And this swinger limit uh, is a limit where you irradiate this uh, laser into the vacuum. Vacuum means that uh, very high vacuum. And then there will be a pair produced out of this vacuum from the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, according to this principle, the vacuum has a, a lot of this uh, virtual uh, particle-antiparticle pair. So when we supply enough the field to separate this uh, electron, they can become real. But this intensity is very high and now I think nobody is thinking how to achieve this one. And if we talk back a lot, Think back about this lower intensity, the relativistic of the. Let's us assume that we have a, a laser, and the laser is represented by a plane wave. We have an oscillating, and the front is a plane, and then this uh, laser can be represented by uh, these functions: a is the vector potentials, and a naught is the amplitude, and it's oscillating with uh, cos or sine functions. So when it is uh, when you solve these equations, if you put the electron in this uh, plane wave and you solve the equation of motions, and you will find that uh, re uh, the velocity of this particle become relativistic. And at what point become relativistic is that when this uh, normalized A, the A naught is larger than once. Whenever we see this A naught this larger than one, which means that the intensity is relativist, uh, relativistic and the electron motion is relativistic. And to have the picture of how this relativistic, we can see of this diagram, the A and B. So at A, the, the wave amplitude or laser amplitude is very small. And this electromagnetic wave, you have the electric component, magnetic component, and you have the K vector. These are propagation directions. So this electron will just oscillate with this electric field. But when uh, this intensity is increased, the oscillation velocity becomes smaller, but the electron will move forward. And why is this? And this is because the effect of the magnetic field, that is the relativistic effect. If you look at this uh, Lorentz equation, you'll find this uh, 
the v over c so for when it's non-relativistic which means that v over c is very small and you have only the effect from the electric field and when the intensity is growing then this v will start to growing and the magnetic field effect will come into play so you can see the velocity of this here so uh, the rate one here is the uh, oscillation velocity by the e-force growing and then reducing when the a naught is increasing a naught is the is the amplitude the wave amplitude and while the this uh, relativistic effect or the magnetic field effect become strong and then if when we have this uh, relativistic intensity we are thinking like what we can do with uh, this relativistic intensity so one one possible way one thing is that we can use the this intent relative intensity to make an electron acceleration that uh, I just mentioned, the laser wave field acceleration. Um, typically, there are two types of this uh, plasma accelerate. So one type is that you use the laser, you fire the laser into a plasma. The second type is you fire a, a beam, a particle beam into a plasma. But uh, today I am just talking about this laser so it's called the laser wave field accelerations and this uh, laser wave field accelerations was uh, proposed by these two guys uh, professor tajima and uh, dawson and they are a very big person uh, a kind of very big boss in the in the plasma community so everyone know knows uh, their names so um yeah and then about this concept of, of uh, laser accelerations um, we have to talk about this uh, ponderomotive force if uh, we know that uh, uh, the laser pulse the laser field is not the constant so the laser field is not the constant like uh, we see just now varied by just a cosine term instead this laser field or the a naught is varying in space so which means that at some point there is no no electric field and it grows until a maximum like a like a gaussian so for a picture like here so you see this uh, the plot of the intensity over the over uh, spatial D. so the intensity kind of so when we have this profile this uh, electric field model into the Lorentz force we expand with uh, Taylor the Taylor series we'll end up that the force is proportional to the gradient of the electric field grade that is the gradient of intensity and there's a negative sign in front which means this neg negative sign means that the electron will move away from the high intensity part which means that if you have a laser moving and you have an electron in at rest so this laser will tend to push push the electron away to to the, the other side so this is a concept that will is used in this uh, uh, laser wave field so for example, you have uh, this red laser pulse. So you have the high intensity at the center and very low intensity at the front. So this front will push the electrons away to one side. Okay. In the plasma, we have uh, ions and electrons. So electron is lighter and is moving uh, easier to move, but the ion will stay behind. So when this uh, electron is pushed to one part leaving the ion behind we create kind of the capacitor and this capacitor is moving with the laser pulse when we have this capacitor whenever the electron is trapped inside this uh, potential 
and the capacitor potentials. So it, this electron will move higher to higher and higher. And this, uh, the potential between this uh, capacitor can be more than the 100 gigawatt per meter, which is uh, more than the breakdown of a, of a linear accelerator. And that is what we use it for, for acceleration. At the same time, we reduce the, the size of the accelerator. So here is uh, some reason that uh, why we use uh, laser plasma, because they have a high accelerate, acceleration gradients as compared to the conventional accelerator. The conventional accelerator probably around 100 megawatt per meter. And then uh, cost reduction and space saving. So this uh, accelerator is actually just a few millimeters to centimeters compared to the accelerator of uh, like in some linear accelerator, they have a meter or kilometer scale. So to this uh, figure is actually, they are performing the experiment of laser wake field. And the accelerator is actually in front on the table. So this is the setup of the accelerator. We have a gas, a jet, kind of a, a jet, and the jet will emit the gas like a helium or, or something gas. And the laser is shooting inside and there will be an electron coming out. And we separate the electron and we will get uh, some energy like uh, this simulation shown here. zoom out of operations. So the gas jet you see just now, and this is what is happening inside. So if I wake uh, the capacitor that uh, I mentioned, the electron is trapped behind the laser. In the laser. This is just a simulation that achieve this up to, to for, for one millimeter of the gas. So, videos that is uh, uh, demonstrated by the group in the Germany. Operations and they, they use uh, GP some some description in this when the video is running.
Right, I should click what optimize sound. Um. Uh, oh, yes, doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Yeah, yesterday we tested there's a sound, but today yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. But never mind. Um, okay. Yeah, I, if you have question about this, uh, uh, this picture or this uh, video, actually you can find it on the YouTube. If you type the pick on GPU 3D, you can find not only this video, but there's uh, a few a few more videos. And then the these electrons can can be used as a radiation source. For example, if you send this, uh, uh, I don't know if you know about this uh, Bremsstrahlung. This is a German Bremsstrahlung is a German word. is uh, means breaking radiation. Which means that when you you send an electron into the high Z material, for example, the gold or tungsten, and this electron will collide with the Coulomb potential of the this material, and the Coulomb potential will reflect these electrons, and then during the reflect, the electron is accelerated, and then radiation will be emitted. So, and we are using this radiation for some purpose. Another one is uh, the first one you see a beta tron radiation. Um, this one is a bit, uh, uh, how to say, if you imagine just now you see the electron inside this uh, laser wick field, the electron is not just moving in a forward direction, there's uh, some oscillations inside happening, but the oscillation kind of uh, a bit small, you cannot see it. And this oscillation actually also emit the radiations, but the radiation emits is uh, in the X-ray regime, like uh, a few hundred uh, keV. And uh, we also use this beta tron radiation for some imaging uh, scanning or something like that. And another thing is uh, uh, Thomson scattering. There's, there's a linear and non-linear Thomson scattering. Basically, Thomson scattering is that when you have an electron at rest, you fire a laser, and then the, the electron is uh, absorbed and then emit the radiations. And then the non-linear means that you absorb not only one photons, but many photons, and things become non-linear. And Compton backscattering, the same thing. There's uh, Compton scattering, Compton backscattering. So back backscattering typically means the the head-on collisions. So the laser and electron head-on collisions. So for the linear Compton's backscattering, which means that uh, the electron only absorbs one photon and emit a, a big gamma ray. But uh, in non-linear, it means that uh, it absorbs not, not only one, but multi-photon, because uh, in the laser, we have a, a lot of photon inside. So this is pretty useful if you have, if you can absorb many uh, laser photon and emit a high, high energy gamma, and yeah, it's will, it's become very useful for some application. And then the this uh, radiation that I mentioned just now, if you see, where is my pointer? Okay. So if you see the left here, you have a laser gas, and then you have a tantalum. It's kind of the high Z material. So the electron passing through deflect by the these tantalums and emit a gamma ray. You send this gamma ray into a radioactive material or in a, any isotope. You act and this gamma ray will interact with this isotope and eventually will change the from one isotope to another and this uh, uh, photo we call a photonuclear interactions is happening 
like in between the photon energy 10 to 30 MeV. And we call this uh, photonuclear reaction cross-section that we call this uh, peak is a resonance, which means that the interaction is peak around a specific energy. So we are looking at the uh, how to produce the gamma ray between this energy for these applications. So we need the uh, help from this uh, uh, optimize the lasers or the gas or the plasma to get the electrons and make this uh, gamma ray in this energy or this uh, nuclear application. So if let's say if you have a fission product like a nuclear, like a, this a tin 126, and it has a half, a quite a long half-life, and you, you make some, this photonuclear reaction, you actually can uh, reduce, uh, change from one element to another element, and uh, you reduce the half-life. And unfortunately, this process is not easy, and it is still in the, in the research and how to increase this uh, the process uh, cross-section. And then we have uh, another called the single photon emission tomography. Um, this one is uh, a bit different from the PET, the positrons. This one is uh, it emit only uh, one photon. For the positron uh, tomography, it's emit two photons because we use an uh, annihilation of uh, positron and electron, but this is just one photon. That is, uh, we use this uh, element, the technetium-99 at the metastable state, but this element is not uh, occurring in nature. We have to create it. So we have to create it from the reactor, from somewhere, but that is kind of, uh, a shortage of this uh, reactor, the product from the reactor. So we have to think of another way how to uh, build this, uh, create this technician. And one way is that we use the gamma radiations and we uh, irradiate the gamma on the molybdenum and we will change it to the this another molybdenum and technetium. It's called just uh, what photonuclear transmutations. And this thing is also uh, in uh, active research. And this technetium will be used for this uh, medical scanning, for example, the image that you see is rotating. Yeah. And then uh, Another thing is uh, radiography. And for example, there's a paper published in Nature about this uh, radiography. They use a, uh, uh, what they call the laser wake field -like accelerations that uh, you have seen in the simulation just now. Instead, now you put a solid foil in front of the laser. So the laser will hit on the solid foil and being reflected. And the reflection of the laser will make a head-on collision with these uh, electron beams and produce a high energy X-ray beam, X-ray. And they demonstrate how to use this X-ray for some uh, radiography. And this, uh, this method is become quite uh, popular after there are publications and many modification of this method is being carried out. And then the, just now what I, meant, I mentioned just about nonlinear Compton scattering, all those things, all those uh, nonlinear things, not only Compton scattering, we also have a uh, nonlinear pair production, but I'm not going to talk about this pair production. All of this, we call it a uh, nonlinear quantum electrodynamics. So that means uh, the electron absorb the multi-photons, but this uh, electron also at the same time oscillating in the, in the laser field. And 
there is a calculation to get the cross section you hear is a you see this uh, formula, the Langley formulas, and uh, you have the this kind of Feynman diagram for this uh, uh, nonlinear Compton backscattering. So you see the double line. Double line means uh, they say dress electron in the external field, and which means that this electron is inside the laser. It's not in the vacuum. So. There's an interaction occurring and then emit the gamma ray. And then the electron is still inside the, the electron. So there, there was an experiment in London, uh, in the in UK. They make this uh, nonlinear Compton scattering with uh, electron from the laser wake field. And they did measure some photon spectra and they the greenness, the green band is the uh, experimental result and fit it with the uh, experiment. And we also managed to reproduce this uh, experimental result by using some code by myself. And uh, yeah, pretty, I, how to say, the simulation is a kind of powerful method to explain what is happening inside the, the experiment. And then after that, we have this uh, ex, uh, experiment of this radiation reaction. Um, radiation reaction means that uh, if, let's say, when the electron is emitted photon, and this photon has a momentum, so this photon will when the emission during the emission this photon will make a kick onto the the electron itself so in quantum this is called kind of kick but in classical we call this a re reaction force if you remember the newton third law action and reactions so the radiation have a reaction onto the electron and this uh, radiation reaction was uh, it's an old problem. Uh, was first discussed by Lawrence, Dirac, and Abraham, but it's still not solving today. We do not know what is the exact equation of motion that described because uh, there are many uh, difficulty when solving this equation. Uh, yeah, this one of the unsolved problem in classical like uh, classical e, uh, EM field. And we want to know which they are, of course, people have uh, come up with different models and we don't know which one is true actually. So we want to perform the experiment to verify which one is true. And the reason why this is still unsolved because this radiation reaction is only significant when the, the laser field amplitude is high enough when the laser field is small, you basically you see nothing. So it's uh, depend on the that that is depend on the laser technology. So until now we only have the chance to to do this experiment because we have the uh, the ten petawatt or one petawatt uh, lasers. And this is a proposal for the experiment here. And yeah, we will perform this uh, experiment in a few years, I think. And then the, this uh, talk about this uh, simulation that you see in the video and also this, those picture. And uh, how do we simulate this, uh, this uh, interaction? You imagine that in the plasma, you not only have uh, ion, you have electron. And not only one of them, not only one, but many of them. And to simulate one of every one of them is impossible. So there's a kind of method called the particle in cell code, particle in cell method. So um, today I'm just talking about this PIC method. Of course, there are other, other methods like uh, magnet, magnetic hydrodynamics and particle, uh, particle code. But uh, today just focus on the number three. So 
this uh, particle in cell basically uh, solve a couple of equations, couple equation that is, uh, you solve a Lorentz equations. In this Lorentz equation, when you have the, the electric field, you have the magnetic field, you solve this force to get the momentum. From the momentum, you solve to get the velocity and then you get the, the trajectory. So you, when you have this various velocity, you put it to make a current because the moving particle create a current. So this current, you put it into the Maxwell equations and you solve this Maxwell equation. And, and then this Maxwell equation, you get a new, because you have the, the perturbation from this particle and the field have to change. So it's not constant. So the field have to change. When the check the field have to change, so the particle motion have to change also. So it's a endless loop. But we we will limit ourselves into how long the simulation simulation will run. So just now I said that uh, it's impossible to simulate uh, every particle in the plasma. So we, the this particle in cell method is that. We represent this uh, real particle, a few of them, into a computational particle. So, which means that this each real particle have the same have the same momentum and position and energy, and and then we represent with uh, this we call macro particle, and we assign this macro particle uh, charge distributions, and then we put into the computational cell. This com uh, I will show you this computational cell is kind of very small. And this simulation is uh, kind of heavy simulations. And you need to uh, run it on the supercomputer. So how do we run it in the supercomputer is that uh, for example, the 2D simulation you see here, this is the laser weak field experiment that you see just now. And this is uh, the whole simulation regions. So if you zoom in very small, this uh, particle that you see here is actually just a very small part of the simulations. So there are a few million of that. And then we split these uh, simulations into different parts, and then we assign this every uh, each part to different uh, cores. So if you use a CPU, we call cores, and we transfer those data back and forth. And then this cores not only just four, but we can up to thousands. Yeah, in for 3D simulations, we can split it uh, as a cube to many cores, and yeah, and this uh, simulation or the uh, the polarization method we use, we call it the domain domain decomposition, which means we split the domain for different cores, and the data transfer is by using the MPI. MPI means for message passing interface. You have to send um, information to another call to tell us what is going on next. So this uh, MPI uh, mostly support for C++ and Fortran. And that is the reason why most uh, supercomputer in the world support these two, two codes. And then uh, there are two types of, uh, uh, not two types, two code that uh, we are using now to for the simulation. One is called Epoch. It's developed in the Warwick University in the UK. And this is right on your Fortran and run on just on your CPU. And the Picon GPU is developed uh, by the Hemholz, uh, Hemholz Dresden in Germany. And this is run, this is written in C++ and it can run on the GPU and also the CPU. And I have the chance to run this code on the, the Greek supercomputer. So you see the picture below. And uh, 
there's a call hours allocate kind of uh, the how to say computational time that given to you so you need to use all of this before the project finish like the project for one year it gives you a 20 uh, 200 thousands call hours and you can use 200 thousand call hours and then kind of uh, we use this simulations uh, method to simulate uh, many interactions for example the lasers uh, interaction with a solid foil and what you see here is the laser coming from the left and then hit ionize the foil and being reflected when it's uh, reflected the laser will focus instead of just just a pulse and we can also change the shape of this and then we get the parab uh, focusing like a parabola and we can do many things with that and then we also can reproduce the experimental result for example we have this uh, experimental last year and uh, laser wake field with a uh, hundred of terawatt lasers and uh, shooting into the helium gas and then what we get is uh, this is the energy the ener uh, no this is the number of uh, electron over the energy so we get a, a peak at the 160 mev from the experiment and then we try to re uh, reproduce uh, this experiment to understand what the physics is happening because we don't in experiment we don't really see every de every detail every physics we use the simulation to match and we manage to reproduce uh, close to experimental result and we have run a lot of simulations and we get uh, roughly 100 uh, 180 or 100, uh, 170 peak at this uh, uh, energy and this this is the video of the experiment uh, from the simulate uh, simulation of the experiment this video has no sound just yeah so this, this is what would happen inside the experiment so you see, see the the laser is moving and then it's changing because the laser is transferring the energy so the laser have, have to re, have to be absorbed by the plasma and the background you see the gray one is the plasma yeah and then not only this uh, laser weak field, you can use it to study the laser solid interactions. For example, people use it to study uh, irradiation on the nanowires. So nanowires means that the diameter of this wire is uh, 100 nanometers. And then we also study the ionization, how the electron transport in this uh, solid target and also the high harmonic generation well this is kind of a bit uh, at once when you irradiate the laser on the surface there's an oscillation in the plasma surface and this oscillation create this uh, radiation it's called the high harmonic radiations and then we also can use this to optimize the experiment, uh, the run, like how many core is a uh, is a peak performance. Uh, it's not it's not always the the more the more core the better. Sometimes there is a peak, like for example, when you reach like eight hundred cores, and you do it again with a thousand cores, the time is the same. So there's a there's a performance uh, uh, peak over there. So we can use it to optimize the simulations and also the experiment. And uh, in conclusion, so the electron motion in in this uh, laser become relativistic at the intensity above ten to eighteen watt per centimeter square. So we use these uh, lasers for the laser victory accelerations. 
the aim is to reduce the size of the accelerator to a tabletop. And uh, this accelerated electron can be used for a radiation source. And this radiation source can be used also for many applications. So another is the particle in cell method. It's used to simulate these uh, laser plasma interactions. We solve the Lorentz and Maxwell equation. And we actually can use this uh, method to make a virtual experiment and to see how this, uh, to see what is the expected outcome. And uh, we put the theory into test, explain and uh, optimize the experiment because this uh, method is cheap and time efficient. Because uh, making experiment, you have to buy the lasers, you have to make the setup mirrors, laser and mirror is not a cheap, it's not cheap like a field, 10 of thousand euros or something like that. And simulation, when you have a supercomputer, you just run it. And maybe the longest you get uh, just in a few weeks or the shortest maybe in one hour, you can get the result. So that is it. Thank you for listening. And here is the is my email and the collaboration and support from different group and friends. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you for sharing your uh, amazing experience at the uh, Extreme Line Infrastructure Nuclear Physics at Romania and also uh, your uh, research experience. So let's um, now proceed to the Q&A session. So uh, Yongqing, would you like to share the uh, Q&A, sorry, the pattern? Okay. Uh, should I stop sharing? Uh, probably you can. Okay. Yeah, okay. So he's taking over. Oh, okay. It seems like we have no questions from the Padlet, which means, um, probably they all of them understood one is everything, and there there are no more further questions already. So, um, hmm, okay. Since we have no questions from the Padlet, uh, I see that we have Doctor Saki now with us tonight. She is a medical physicist uh, from USM. Uh, Dr. Sakina, do you have any questions? Um, uh, Dr. Hong, hi. Uh, hi. This is Sakina. Uh, I'm basically like doing medical physics. And it's very interesting to know that you can actually get X-ray and gamma ray from, lean, uh, from laser. Because when, when we did like, and you even mentioned about SPAT as well just now, uh, mm -hmm. because it's really related to my field, which is medical physics. Um, I'm just wondering whether this this laser um, that you use as a linear accelerator is used in a clinical setting right now, or just like in experimental setting? Um, now it's uh, in the research stage. Oh, so 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 it's it's basically not yet used in the clinical uh, because. I'm quite surprised that um, we have come to the technology because I've heard about that um, laser photo, sorry, photoacoustic where you use a sound wave to produce um, an image. But this is my first time listening that you can use a laser to even produce a gamma ray and x-rays. So it's, it's, yes. it's, it's very interesting actually yeah, to see that um, perhaps um, in the clinical setting soon. If, um... For sure, we can produce the gamma ray and uh, uh, X-ray with the laser, and it's quite matured already. And uh, I'm not sure is there any clinical setting for now, but for experimental, we can we can produce the X-ray and the gamma ray. The remaining is how to use this X-ray to optimize for the nuclear interaction to produce those medical isotopes. There is a proposal and experiment, but uh, we need to optimize this. And this is still in the, in the research uh, stage.
Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ong. Uh, do anyone have any more questions? Would you like to, you can, uh, you are welcome to turn on the mic and ask. Hi. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, hi, yes. Siu Yen. Nice to meet you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I would like to say thank you for this talk. This is uh, quite fascinating to me. And uh, I have two questions uh, specifically. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't see the slide number, but I could recall that uh, you were talking about the quantum scatterings. Do you mind if you could uh, turn yes. to the slide? Uh, with uh, Compton scattering, this one. Yes, yes, exactly. So I have two questions. Um, the first one is I, I'm curious about the experimental uh, arrow band, the the one that's shown in the the green color. So I reckon that this is like one sigma standard arrows. Uh, and this is the experimental uh, like associated arrow, or it is from the simulations? This is from the experiment. The, the band is from the experimental. Okay. And the red line is the uh, simulation fitting. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, the second question is, uh, this is related to the backgrounds. So, um, for example, a, I mean, I am the I'm the experimentalist by myself. So usually, what we do is we simulate the uh, the signals, and then at, the, at on the other hand, we simulate the backgrounds. So what we do is we usually do some, uh, uh, let's say, signals enhancements by reducing the, uh, the the noises of the backgrounds in order to increase the sensitivities of the signals before we do a uh, measurements by comparing it to the. Uh, the experimental data. So my question is, uh, do you involve with the simulations of the backgrounds or you are only working on the uh, the, the signal, which is the weak fields uh, induce uh, electrons? Because if I could understand, you are trying to extract or measure the, the A0 parameters from the experimental uh, data by feeding to your simulations. So on that regard, uh, do you, taking into account of the background simulation as well? I mean, background uh, such as, I mean, in this case, um, background factors such as the uh, the noises from your instrumentations or uh, any other uh, nuisance, nu nuisance uh, process that produce electrons that could confuse uh, your signals, if there's any. No, we, we don't, sim uh, in this simulation, we don't uh, simulate the background. We just uh, take the simulation setup. We try as close as uh, possible to to the experiment. We just uh, simulate simulate and get the signal. Yeah, we don't simulate the background. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, any more questions? Okay. Uh, Thomas, I noticed someone has a question in the padlet, so I'll share the screen right All now. right, sure, sure. Okay, we have a question. So he says, Hi, Doctor. Hi, Dr. Ong. Thank you for your wonderful and amazing sharing. Um, Dr. Ong, are the programming skills crucial if you want to further uh, study in this field? Uh, kind of. Instead of saying programming skill, is more if you want to write the code by yourself. Uh, it's more do you need to understand the the numerical method. Okay, right? so it doesn't matter you use a Fortran or C plus plus or Python, and uh, the difficult part is the numerical method. Yeah, when you do programming, look into the numerical method, how, like say, how to turn the integration, how to make the integration numerically. And that, that's, that is an example. And then the, you have to know how to optimize your, the code 
to the processor or the thing that you are running. Yeah, it's not like you just write a code, a few lines of code, and then just put in and run is fine. And you have to optimize because uh, for a short code, you can run it fast. But if you have a thousand or ten thousand lines of code and a hundred of files in the in the big code, and it become time consuming, and you need to optimize. That is also a, a kind of skill. Okay, thank you, Doctor Ong, for your answer. Um, okay, it seems like we don't have any more questions. Um, we don't have any more from the chat too. Um, okay, so. Mm. Uh, hi, sorry oh, hi. again. Oh, <laughs> it's hi. me again. Sorry, hi. You, hi, you, okay. all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested on about this work. So, just my for my curiosities, may I know what is the uh, the the detectors you use uh, to pick up those uh, electrons uh, produced from the weak field? Um, there's a kind of uh, we call the LaTeX screen. Uh, as I know, they use a kind of a, let me sh share. Um, yeah, if you see this one, there's a LANX screen and also a CCD camera. So this LANX screen is kind of the phosphor screen. So you can get the electron signal uh, the light from this uh, screen and then you measure look at it with the CCD camera and something like that and this thing they have calibrated so they can expect the, the energies from that and then plot the kind of uh, uh, spectrum. I see so are you involved with the calibration effort for example you simulate with Gen4 and then calibrate with the detectors mm. or you are with the beam dynamics uh, simulations what i do is let me show you here what i do what we do is uh, to get the electron spectrum at the at the final point like this one and compared to the experiment, experiment they this uh, kind of LANX screen, and then they have a camera to measure the energy and so on. And we try to match this with experiment. And we want to know how experiment going on. And basically, we don't do any calibration on the experiment part. It's a purely uh, numerical. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um thank you. Um Yongqing, uh do we have another question from Padlet, is it? Okay. Sure. Um sorry again, it's me again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is this is uh, a little bit non related to the work. So uh, are you foreseeing any sort of a collaborations with the local university in Malaysia? Yeah, of course. And we have uh, started the uh, this uh, nuclear photonuclear plus collaboration with uh, with uh, UTM. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it from the other university also. We have, uh, we can come up with uh, many topics that is uh, relevant to to this it doesn't matter laser big field or nuclear or solid interaction i personally do almost everything like i mean the thing that i show you here this is my work this is what i do and parization i did it before and in computational part the laser part i mean the simulation and uh, making movies and also on nanostructure and many topics yeah i see yeah i mean i'm come from a uh, ukm so i am the uh, lecturers uh, working with uh, nuclear science pro programs so 
um, the, the reason why I'm asking this is because I wanted to raise the awareness or to for everybody information that uh, um, that uh, you know the, these these are the information available uh, that could be collaborated uh, with in order to you know to foster the uh, bonds uh, with Eli's uh, uh, these interesting projects. So yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, if you have time, you can take uh, some some. We can take some time to look at the website, the www.eli-np.ro. Okay, thank you, Doctor Ong. Seems very good. Okay, uh, we have. I think we have one last more. I think it's Is there an ongoing research center yeah. or university in Malaysia now? Yeah, it just yeah, we just said. I think it's a, yeah, it's a similar question, right? Yeah, so we have a collaboration with UTM, it seems. Okay, so uh, do you have any more questions from the floor? Anyone? This is the last call. <laughs> Almost I see someone typing in the padlet. Okay. Maybe we wait for them to submit. Sure. sure. The host doesn't have question. The host, no question. very host. good. <laughs> was one, I was wondering, uh, yeah, regarding for my question, because I was waiting for if someone, if there are any questions first. So, okay. Oh, who is this? Oh, he said, Hi, Dr. Ong. Do you mind explaining the ponderal motif force again? Like, why does the electron move away from the laser beam other than there is a minus sign in the expression? Uh, okay, the ponderal motif force is arise from the the shape of the electric field so the electric imagine that electric field is not constant so it has a shape so that shape imagine the shape is a gaussian so there's a peak and there's a zero so uh, you insert this let's say you have a, a gaussian uh, shape you insert this gaussian shape into the Lorentz force the f F equal to the charge time electric field. So electric field is a Gaussian, have a Gaussian shape, but you expand this Gaussian shape with some assumption, of course. You expand this into in a Taylor series. And then you have uh, many terms. So ponderal motive force is this it's not the first first term. i I forgot, I think it's the second of the second terms. So this happened to this term happened to proportional to the minus. You remember the force is a vector. So when whenever you have a minus, you have a direction, different direction. So minus gradient of electric the E field square, that is the gradient of intensity. So the smallest uh, if you have let's say gradient of intensity so when the intensity is small the small part i mean the gradient the small part and then you have a minus so the electron will tend to move in the direction of uh, low intensity so it's which means it cannot go into the high intensity without uh without given uh, a higher energy let's say just the uh, electron at rest. So when the laser pass by, it's just pushing it around. But if you have a high energy electron, like a few hundred GeV, of course you can overcome this force and entering the laser center. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ong. Oh, Dr. Ong, you have something to add? No. Okay. Oh yeah, Dr. Ong, by the way, I have a question. Uh yeah. okay. So in your slides, I see that you are talk you you've been talking about the radiation reaction and you say that uh, it is a unsolved problem in the uh, classical electrodynamics. Uh. So um you uh your team you are doing simulations um to to check which model is correct uh for solving that solving the set of equations so i was wondering uh what are the available models and which are the models that are under uh currently under testing 
which means uh, under um, undergoing simulations to test which are the most probable models uh, do you guys see? Okay, there are three uh, three type of models. Uh, one type we call it uh, land, uh, what they call Landau lift shift. It's a it's a name of uh, it's a name of models. So this model is a classical models. Basically, okay, the the first equation come up for this radiation reaction is the LAD equation. Lawrence, Abraham, and Dirac. So they they are the one who start this this mess. So this equation happened to to have a, a problem of acceleration, which means that uh, when you solve for the acceleration, the acceleration will keep going even if the, there is no laser. So you turn off the laser, the acceleration keep going. So this is this is problem, but not this is not physical. So people, what people are trying to do is also they try to approximate. So they expand the kind of a velocity or something in the Taylor series or, and do some approximation expansion. And then they come up with a models. And this is called a classical radiation reaction models. And this happened on like a moderate laser intensity. And then the, so far this model is uh, easy to comp uh, is, is easy to calculate numerically. And then so far, uh, kind of, so far it looks okay. And, but when these models go, um, when the laser intensity keep increasing, there will be a quantum effect. So in classical, imagine that uh, electron emissions is emit the electromagnetic wave and the momentum or the reaction is uh, kind of small, so the electron trajectory is still smooth, moving smooth, but it's slowly changed, so you will see a circle moving into the center. And if this uh, emission is strong, and it make a kick to the electron, and we call the electron recoil, and that is quantum. When Whenever you have a recoil, which means that uh, emission of photon, uh, emission is a particle, is a photon. So there will be a kick. So they try to add this correction into the classical equations. So far, this equation seems okay. And then the third model is purely, purely quantum model, which means the emissions, uh, the equation is just uh, you added the quantum by hand. And the emission is uh, stochastic, and uh, and so far this model doesn't seem to 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 tell to to match the experiment well, and no one knows why. We have not we, but uh, in UK there's a there was an experiment uh, doing on this, and they found that the classical ones or the correction classical one works works better than the quantum one and they don't know why. So it's still an unsolved problem. So basically you have three models, three basic models. Okay, okay. Thank you. That's clarified. All right. So do we have any more uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? Um if there are no questions then let's proceed to the uh photo shooting session. So probably we we'll have yeah we we'll have to take some photos to commemorate today's event. Uh, Yongjing, are you ready? Uh, Yongjing, you 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 count. Okay, uh, just wait for a while, yeah. Okay, so uh, for those who can open up your camera, please open up your camera. Okay. 
All right. Um, okay. Uh, everyone, if you are able to turn on a camera, please turn on. Don't be shy. Okay. Don't be shy. We are giving you some time to turn on a camera. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Seems not really much. Okay, how many do we have today? We have a hundred and forty participants today. And uh Yongqing, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any so more? I'll count out until three and then I'll take a picture. Okay, so everyone prepare your faces. Yeah. Please smile. smile. Okay, so one, two, and three. Okay. Okay, so I'll take one more. Okay, one, two, and okay, uh, there's someone opening up their cam. Okay, we'll wait for a while. All right. Okay, one, two, and three. All right, done. Oh, okay. So, Yongqing, are we, we are done? Okay. Yep. All right, we're done. Great. All right. So, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Before you leave, um, I think we would like to thank Dr. Ong once again for um, sharing his experience here. We thank you very much. And um, before that, before you leave, um, Umi, would you uh, please share the... Yeah, please share the... Uh, my CSD form below. This is the feedback form. Everyone, please fill in before you leave. It will be op only open for 15 minutes. Okay. And this meeting will be off at um, 10.25. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ong, once again. Thank you, Dr. Sakina. Thank you. All right, bye. Have a nice weekend. Enjoy weekend, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Thank you, Dr. Sakina. Thank you, Dr. Sakina. Yeah. And uh, for AJKs, yeah, for for AJKs of this event, uh, please do not leave. Please hold on a moment. Please hold on a moment. We'll have a post mortem, very short post mortem of this event. Thank you.